As we begin this morning, I would have you open your Bibles uh, to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 and verses 1 through 18. Psalm 139 and verses 1 through 18. Listen carefully to the Word of God. David says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both are alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Let's pray. Our Father, we take your promises at face value. And you have promised that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And we're praying, Holy Spirit, you must speak powerfully. Your presence must be sensed and felt in all that we do in this hour, in the hours to come, in a very <clears throat> powerful and real way. Bless us to that end as we look at this knowledge, this knowledge that you have of us, and say with the, with the man after your own heart, with David, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the word know or knowing is an incredibly significant and critically important word in the Bible. And it has much to do with our spiritual health, and it has much to do with our soundness of mind. As we spent much time last year knowing God, we turn the tide in Psalm 139, as David causes us to consider God knowing us. The emphasis is reversed. Another way of saying this is if Christ in John 17, 3 proclaims the way to salvation or life eternal is by this knowing God, which again we repeat, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, referring to the Father, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Then we see the utter priority and the, the, the grand significance of this word know uh, or knowing. So knowing the Father, knowing the Son, and the Holy Spirit is implied, but know this distinction. The Holy Spirit is 
the knowing. He is the knowing of them all. I speak of the Trinity. Just as Edwards asserts that he is the love amongst them and between them. Now allow me to substantiate this. There is, as you've lived any length of time in this world, <clears throat> there is much falsehood in both the physical uh, as well as the spiritual realm. What's right? What's wrong? Who has the answer? Who has the corner on truth? And I believe Pilate was a prime example of the most this, this kind of most disillusioned position. What is truth? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence or from here. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? But how shall I know? Key word. As a child of God, the truth. A true understanding of God from a false or erroneous understanding or knowing. Now listen. It is in the person of the Holy Spirit who is, as described by Christ himself, the spirit of truth and who is our knowing. Knowing and understanding go together. Now listen to the scripture, 1 John 5.20. And we know, John says, now that the Son has come, but before the Son came, it was our very sad state and position along with the whole world that lieth in wickedness or that lieth in darkness or that lieth in confusion, not knowing the truth. We were with them. We were among them. There we were, as Philip Bliss put it in his famous hymn, dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes. We could not see or know God. Had we searched and labored all our days, we would have never come to know God or gain a proper understanding of Him. But God be praised, John says, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true. Even the, His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. And further He says, Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, the one who does have the corner on truth, is come, He will guide you into, into all truth. So think about this. The Holy Spirit is going to guide us into all truth. Now is this truth a person? As Christ describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Something to ponder. Is it he that is Christ, who the Spirit is guiding us into? For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. John 15, 26, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So I trust you can see that the Spirit is the knowing and our way to knowing him that is true. And he is as much the Spirit of truth as he is the Spirit of love. Frequently he's pictured as the gentle dove. And I believe just as he pours and sheds abroad the love of God into our hearts, so he disperses and sheds it abroad in the Trinity. More specifically, between the Father and the Son. There are a few illustrations or a, or a few analogies that we could make. 
the father kind of looks down to the son and love flows to him. The son looks up to the father and his love flows back to him, the father. But what is this uh, channel? What exactly is this back and forth communication of love? I think of Jacob's ladder with angels ascending and descending, and it provides kind of an illustration or a likeness. This reciprocation of the Son loving the Father and the Father loving the Son is the Holy Spirit's work, but more precisely, it is who and what He is. Coming to clearly understand the work and the beauty of the person of the Holy Spirit would be tremendously edifying to, to all of us this year. And I have this thought that we are going to hear much this year about the precious Holy Spirit. As He is absolutely essential and necessary in the Trinity and plays such a vital role and part there, so He does in each of our lives, brethren. He is the divine communicator. And I say it reverently, He is the Trinitarian glue, creating a homogenous bond of love within the Blessed Trinity. He is the divine pipeline or conduit through which this love flows back and forth. And here is another thought I would have you ponder. The Holy Spirit is God and has much of a part. He has such an integral part in the Holy Trinity that could it even be said that God is love if the Holy Spirit was absent. Would the Father and the Son be love? God is love. Would the Father and the Son be love if there were no Holy Spirit? Just some further confirmation in my mind as to who the Holy Spirit is. But returning to some precious thoughts that David brings to us, turning our meditation from the glories of us knowing God and delighting in the Trinity, he brings us into another world, an equally glorious world of God knowing us. But when I say David brings us into this other world, I'm not talking about some mystical uh, stratosphere or something very intangible or something very impractical. The Lord has impressed me and, and He has impressed upon my mind greatly for some time the vital importance of our salvation being real, not imaginary, not notional, not speculative, and not otherworldly. Real. If all preaching lacks this element, it is the cause of us all soon forgetting what we heard, even a few minutes after whoever finishes preaching. I would say it's probably okay to use yourself as an example in preaching if it's not self-exalting, but more self-abasing. So allow me to show you a problem I have often faced, though it was subtle, to make this point. I'm listening to a message. And the preacher takes me suddenly to another world, perhaps with the disciples as they were being taught at Jesus' feet. Or I am brought to be among the children of Israel before Moses. But I'm taken into this narrative so much and so taken away and so taken into it so deeply that I suddenly realize that I have left my world that world where my shoe leather hits the ground. You know, CBC Lane out there. And for a season, the preaching is having this kind of ethereal and kind of otherworldly effect. But then the preacher concludes, and as we mingle afterwards, there is a coming back to reality. You may be able to identify with some of this. <clears throat> But we, as we mingle, we are we're coming back to the reality that is real to us, where we live, 
or the life in the here and now is what I'm saying. <clears throat> so maybe you can relate, maybe you can't. But it it's really has forced me to ask some questions. Why do we forget messages? How come they don't stick? Why am I not able to bring the message into the work week? Years ago, when I was stationed at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, about the time I met Pam, I listened to this Christian radio station, and every day they featured a, a part of the program which was called Words to Live By. It's called Words to Live By. A verse or a portion of scripture was then read, and then they briefly uh, would comment on that verse. But that title, Words to Live By, has stuck with me all these years. I thought, that's it. I need something I can sink my teeth into. I am navigating through a confused and hostile world. I need to know how to live life in it. I need words to live by. So that's what I listen for. And now it is what I want my sermons to contain. I do not want my salvation or my savior to be separate from me. So I not only want to have and to give words to live by, but I need to have and to hold the word to live by, who is Christ, for me to live. And when I say I need him to live by, I mean by me, near me, beside me, which echoes back, dearly beloved, to this all-important principle that salvation is a relationship. Salvation is not a bunch of activity. Salvation is a relationship with a person. Salvation is an intimate relationship. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you, I have called you, Friends. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And I would add, because of this relationship, it says, and he was called the friend of God. You can't have a relationship with someone who is not your friend. So the question I would put before all of us is, how is your relationship with God? How near, dear, and real is your friendship with Jesus? What do you think of him? David is going to tell us what he thinks of us. But to lighten the tone and to show you how practical, present day, and real this relationship needs to become, have you ever asked Jesus in prayer if he likes Snickers bars? Is he shoulder to shoulder with you with equal enthusiasm watching the Super Bowl? One of the indictments of the wicked is God is not in all his thoughts, Psalm 10.4. Is he in all our thinking? Is he in all our walking and standing and sitting and lying down? Let me say this. He would not be in all our thoughts unless we were in all of his. <clears throat> Do you believe that you are a major preoccupation with God? We would not know God unless he first, in the fullest sense of the word, first knew us. But today we change directions and perspective from our view of God to his view of us. From us knowing God to God knowing us. The great apostle brings the two together in a simple statement sets before, he sets before the Galatians. It's almost like he pauses. But he says, but now after that ye have known God, <clears throat> or rather are known of God, and that's as much of the verse as we want to consider, Paul makes a distinction in these perspectives. Is one more important than the other? 
Are these two different relationships or is it one glorious relationship of me knowing him and now him knowing me? Let's get real practical. Beloved, does it matter to you that God knows you? <clears throat> is there an awareness of him knowing you? Do you know what it means to be known of God? And need I say it again, I'm not talking about knowing about you. And neither is David in this psalm, far from it. Don't allow your mind to always think in the negative either. Yes, he says to some, depart from me, I never knew you. But just suppose he turns that around and says, come to me, for I have always known thee. I have always known you. How long has he known thee? David will show us that here as well. He will show us that this is not a general knowing, as in Acts 15, 8, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. No, this, this knowing particularizes. It is specific and a particular knowledge, as in, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Amos 3, 2. But, the, but furthermore, this particular psalm shows three of God's major attributes. Active in David's life and active in ours. Omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. Or all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing, which is the most dominant here. I would also point out that God's knowing and God's seeing are often paired together and speak very loudly of this divine awareness, I'll call it. For example, we see it with Hagar in the Old Testament and we see it with Nathanael in the New. John 1.48, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Soon after the Lord had seen and heard Hagar's affliction, it says, and she called the name of that place, and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. Proverbs 15.3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Second Chronicles 16.9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Okay, anthropomorphisms, that's fun to say. But when we ascribe human characteristics to God, it's not to ask the question, does God have eyeballs? He, his seeing is his knowing. Hagar was not happy simply because God could see where she was geographically. He saw her and he knew her and he relieved her affliction. So let us now with David contemplate the extreme blessing and privilege of knowing God, knowing us. In verse 1 of Psalm 139, David exclaims, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. And the first thing we notice here is the expression, O Lord, not simply Lord, as we find in other Psalms. And this expression reflects a deep emotion and affection in David. A sense of being overwhelmed uh, as he is expressing himself in this way to the Lord. But it's, it's an overwhelming in a good sense. It is, it is breathtaking in a good sense. And then he uses a term for the highest and fullest and most reverential name of God. Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Jehovah. Self-existent. Eternal. The Jews held this name of God as sacred and did not and would not even pronounce it. 
Scribes later inserted vowels giving us the names Yahweh and Jehovah. So David begins praying to the all-knowing and all-seeing God. Thou God seest me. Not simply watching and observing me, but studying and searching me out in every part. Examining, yes, with a delight in what his hands have made. The work of thy hands. Thou has investigated and searched me most thoroughly. As a jeweler, a diamond. Turning it first this way and that. What is the jeweler looking for? What is his searching out and critical investigation hoping to uncover? Well, four things are what the human jeweler searches for. Color, clarity, cut, and carat, which is the weight of, or the size of the diamond. But ultimately, he is searching for the dazzling beauty and the eye-catching sparkle of the precious gem. That is what is precious in his sight. What about the divine? David says, Thou hast searched me. You have looked me all over. What, O Lord, has been of value in your eyes and precious in your sight? Isaiah 43 helps us here. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee. David says, knitted me together in his mother's womb. Since thou was precious in my sight, to this end have I searched thee. Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. So knowing this search was from a motive of love, David later invites it. If you look down there in verse 23 of the, of the psalm, he says, Go ahead, search me, O God, and know me, and know my heart. And this is the other part of verse 1, this knowing, this knowing David to the depths and to the intimacy of his very heart. So it, it's, it's this full expression, O oh, great Jehovah, O oh, holy Trinity, thou hast searched me and known me. These are inseparably linked. And David is marveling at this connection of knowing and searching him. You know me and are intimately acquainted with me because of your search. Because thou hast searched me and have been for all eternity searching me, you know me. And your knowing me equates to your loving me. The obvious fact in David's mind is God searches out what he loves and delights in, just like the jeweler, the diamond. The gemstone. We, the people of God, he calls the apple of his eye. So we must ask this. Is this Old Testament knowing the same intimate gnosko of the New Testament? <clears throat> Unequivocally and irrefutably, yes. Y-A-D-A, yada, pronounced that way is the Hebrew word for known here. Thou hast searched and known me. Same exact word found in Genesis 4.1. Where I put it delicately, yet bluntly, Eve would have never conceived and bare Cain had Adam simply known about her. Simply known about her. David is saying, O oh Lord, you have a very intimate and personal knowledge of me. I pray the Holy Spirit just now as each individual soul here, believer, child of God, is the Spirit is beginning to, to see of the value that God puts in you. The, the greatness of his love for you. I hope you're seeing and I hope you're feeling that through this. How personal and close is God, is Jesus to you? 
Does he walk with thee and talk with thee and sit down and rise up with thee? Do you feel him near? Can you reach out and touch him as it were? Or at least at times? So I, for myself, my most earnest, strongest, and repetitive prayer for myself and for you is to know this personal relationship with God, with Jesus, with the Trinity. I want to know Him knowing me. When I hear other men's sermons, I want to come to meet with Jesus. I want to fellowship and sup with Him and He with me in these sermons. My salvation and my relationship must be real, actual, and solidified in church going and in sermon listening and hearing, and not some disillusioning fantasy from hell, which Satan would love to keep us occupied with. Is there realness to this thing? Is God real? Is salvation real? All that questioning. It is real. And it's here. And it's for us. I want to know why five minutes after I leave church, I can't remember the message. Or why I'm so quickly and easily drawn away by other distractions or attractions. How about the awkward moment around Sunday dinner? So what did you learn at church today, Johnny? Jesus said, Jesus declared, Jesus promised, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Real, close, personal. But you say, John, how do you know he's not in our midst? How do you know he is? Well, you say, I, I know because he said it. You know it because he said it? That doesn't make any sense. As the word know is being used here by David, I know it because he said it is simply another way of saying, I know it because of who said it. Or I, I know what he said. Well, we all know what he said. He said a lot of things, but that's not the knowing of his very presence in our midst when the two or more of us are gathered together. For me, if it is not a loving felt presence, it is empty. He talks about a joy of salvation. Is that just some fabricated thing? <clears throat> and it is not the knowing that David is revealing in, reveling in, really, and as he as he now describes uh, specifics, he descends to particulars here, heartwarming specifics. He begins to know, to delightfully comprehend and feel the extent to which God knows him, the where, the how, and the when he knows him. So he starts in verse 2. Thou knowest my down-sitting. He is saying, you have a keen interest in everything I do and in all that I am and in everywhere I am. You know why I sit down and every occasion of it, whether sitting from weariness, from the day's labors and toiling through the day, or down-sitting to stop and think through diff a difficulty or just... Re revolve some thorny issue or some some difficulty the wife says of her husband I know him so well that is his favorite easy chair where I've often seen him quietly musing or perhaps meditation and prayer God knows you're down sitting beloved and he sits alongside you there do you sense and feel his presence do you crave and long and pant for it as the deer the water brooks? Or are you satisfied with the leeks and the garlic from Egypt? The emptiness 
of no relationship. Pam has her time and place of down-sitting, faithfully, every morning, having devotions, as we call them. God knows that place, that place of her down-sitting. But aren't our devotions really our desire to meet with Him, to meet with God, to know Him in our down-sitting as He knows our down-sitting? Do you see how real and practical this is? God can make it very clear when He is present, when He is right next to you. I pray for it because He promised it. I'm not suggesting you adopt my praying style or manner. We all have our personalities that God has given us. But when I have prayed to feel Him near, as many have, and I don't, I begin to wonder what's up. And I do believe, agree or not, that just like two lovers, sometimes he plays hard to get. And so I am not shy or afraid to say to him, are you there or not? Do you pray that way? Listen, I want you to forget me, what you think of me, what you think of John Willette. I want you to hear the message through me. You shouldn't be considered any man that comes up here. But what, it, what is God saying through the man? <clears throat> Remember, it's a relationship, beloved. It's not something self-fabricated. It's not something imaginary. God knows and he knows my down-sitting is to experience this, this friendship with him. The thought came to me, is it really the goal a God has for us to know him knowing me? Is the bulk of our salvation to cultivate this all-powerful and intimate relationship with him? I think so. And Jesus thinks so. I would, he says. I will. This is what I want. I would that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. I do not believe he was talking about location there, but about a condition or a position. This love relationship that he wills that we share in. I think you remember that territory. But when after I have communed with him and sought to fellowship with him, and sup with him, as he promised, in my down-sitting. It's time to then rise. And David says he knows that also very well. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Whether it is the first rising when I awake from a night of sleep, or my uprising getting up from my easy chair, he knows that also, and is there, and wants to know. He knows when I sat long enough and it's time to rise. He knows when I have come up with a game plan and now it's time to execute. And though this is not the way the word is being used here, God is very aware of my other uprisings, uprisings in my soul, the uprising of the enemies of my soul rising up against me. But now David goes further and considers something even more profound of God's knowing him and God knowing us, God knowing you. And that is our very thoughts and thinking. David says, thou understandest my thought afar off. This is an amazing consideration. First of all, first off, it is it is it is thought. If you see it there, singular not thoughts, plural, which would imply knowing my thought, the whole processing of information, concepts and ideas. I understand it's my thought. You know precisely, O Lord, not only the thoughts I think, but how I think, how I process, how I reason and deduce, and how I arrive at the conclusions I do. Thou understandest. You have a full and accurate comprehension 
of all my thinking and why I think the thoughts that I do think. Now, I've listened to various preachers through the years, and one who preached on this psalm always kind of seemed to gravitate toward the negative uh, things that he would find in a passage. Excuse me. <clears throat> and he viewed God's knowing of David here in a negative light and like a condemning knowledge or knowing, uh, especially based on David's statement later in verse 7 where he says, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? As if, you know, he, he, was, he was running from God. Well, I couldn't disagree more. We will see that David is simply setting forth uh, hypotheticals to emphasize the point. Does it make you uncomfortable, brethren, or cause you to rejoice that God understandeth your thought and thoughts? Well, I suppose you could answer it depends on what I'm thinking at the time. But do you think on this? There is therefore now no condemnation, but love and mercy coming not from an Old Testament bully, as some have described the God of the Old Testament, knowing your thoughts to condemn you for them, but how Jesus would have you think of him, of him who he's willing to share, my Father and yours. Matthew 6, 26, your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Nehemiah invites God he invites God's thoughts toward him. Think upon me, my God, for good. Think upon me, he says. Do you see the fatherhood of God, of, of, of God in these expressions? The fatherhood of God in David's expressions and in God's thoughts of David. Were God's thoughts of David fatherly? Did he understand the thought of his precious son afar off? Now, I could not find recorded in any of the other Psalms where David, maybe you can, uh, where David refers to God as his father. But he did. God says this of him. He says, I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God and the rock of my salvation. Can you believe, dearly beloved, that God desires and determines to be a father to you? I really think you should go and read uh, Morning and Evening, the morning reading of Spurgeon on January 26, to kind of capture the beauty of God as a father. He basically just looks at that part of the verse, your heavenly Father is what tops that, that morning reading the page. Can you see that as knowing and understanding your thought afar off is because, uh, because of his incredible interest in and love for you? <clears throat> Did you know that he delights in you? He really takes up an interest in you. He wants, without reluctance or compulsion, to be involved in your life. And God always gets what he wants. We just sang about sovereign love. Did you know that none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Do you know what is meant by sovereign love? As your heavenly Father, He is very understanding. He seeks to be sensitive and understanding. Understanding of your confusion. Understanding of your situation. Understanding of your predicament. 
He wants to know what you're thinking so that, if I can put it this way, he can enter in to help. Now, we either believe this is the personal relationship that God desires us to experience with him, or we don't. We either believe the Bible to be the truth, or we don't. Either God is telling us the truth here, or he is lying. If we resist the truth of this relationship that David speaks of here, we may very well be quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. I must think on and cultivate this kind of personal and real relationship with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in this new year, 2024. If God is saying that it is available, we must have it. Every day, every hour, moment, and second of every day, he should occupy our thoughts. As we enjoy the thoughts, the good thoughts that he says he thinks toward us. My thought, David says, thou understandest afar off. What does he mean afar off? He means from a distance, a great distance. He's saying you understand my thought long before my thoughts come to me, before I even think them. From afar, from a long ways away, long before you know what I will think, when I will think, and how I will think. You know it all. David now shifts in his thinking from God knowing all things to God being everywhere in his life. Now, I, I hesitate to say that he's transitioning from uh, omniscience to this omnipresence, and this is because the, the attribute of omniscience is speaking more, more generally. God does know all things. But that is not the general knowing that David has been speaking of to this point. It is a very particular, specific, and personal knowing that equates to a personal loving. So now in verse 3, David leaves his down-sitting and uprising to go from his abode. Although much of his life as a warrior and a fugitive, he had no certain dwelling place. So when he sp speaks of his lying down, it may have been in the wilderness, at night, under the canopy of heaven and the stars. But God was there, present, omnipresent. Wherever he would go, wherever his path would take him, God surrounded him. Thou compassest my path and my lying down. Now that word compassest literally means to winnow. The Hebrew verb zara translated as search out or scrutinize is used of a farmer winnowing his crops to separate the wheat from the chaff. A sieve can be used, but often there is a current of air, wind blown, to winnow or blow away the, the chaff from the wheat berry. So David is saying, you go before me knowing what lies ahead of me in my path, what lurks in ambush. You scrutinize, you search out, separating out the evil and harm from my path. You know the path that I take, and you encompass, encompass me in this path, winnowing away the evil in it. This sense of security and safety endeared David to the Lord. David loved the Lord, and you will love him too. Beloved, when the Holy Spirit speaks this same sense of looking out for you and protection. In Psalm 22 and 35, David calls him his darling. Did you ever begin a prayer to Jesus? Darling. Is he darling? Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Are there dogs in my path? Blow upon them, clear my path of them. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Because rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling, from the lions. Deal with these lions ahead in my path. For the Lord will bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass or compasses him as with a shield. Well, what am I lying down? Will you safeguard that as well, my darling? Psalm 4, verse 8. 
I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety, because thou compassest my lying down as well. And thou art acquainted with all my ways. And we're going to finish up with this. I found this to be very, very personal and down to earth. And thou art acquainted with all my ways, my ways, your ways. What are these ways? We hear expressions like, that's just the way he is. That's just the way I am. That's how I roll. Or language like, that's, that's his way. Or, well, I don't like the way he does things. Well, he doesn't like the way you do things either. This is so power packed. There is so much here for our edification, truly words to live by. Do you know, child of God, who has given you your ways, your manner, your manner of thinking, and your manner of doing? It's not just the way I am. It's the way and the ways God made you. Never be ashamed of your ways. Some people do not like themselves or ways about themselves. It's an oddity. As the scriptures declares, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but cherisheth it, nourisheth it. Do not despise yourself or things or ways about yourself, because your ways speak of your manner and your personality. And your personality speaks of your unique person that God has fashioned, that God has formed. Yea, that God has knit together, which we will see more of next time, from the very womb, from the womb. Just as he told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. David saw that God was acquainted with all his ways, and further he saw that God delighted in his ways, because David's ways were the very way that God created him. And just like in Genesis 1 and verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So when he fashioned David and determined his personality and his ways, there was the same divine complacency and delightful response, behold, it was very good. When he birthed you into this world, he said, behold, it is very good. To this point, can you make personal application of these things? Can you make real and practical application of these things? Oh, may the Holy Spirit remove any doubt in your mind that you are of infinite worth to the Father and the Son, that they have the highest regard for you, that the Father brags on you, even as he said of Jesus, this is my beloved Son. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Your heavenly Father does not search and know you to find fault, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He does not acquaint himself with all your thoughts, with his own evil thoughts, but his thoughts toward you are pure and pleasant. He could not have spoken it clearer. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Let's pray.